We have more news on Monday's mass shooting that terrified parade watchers in a Chicago suburb on the 4th of July. Authorities on Tuesday charged the suspect, who we're not naming, with seven counts of first-degree murder after an additional victim died. Police also say the suspect has confessed and that after fleeing the shooting scene for neighboring Wisconsin, he briefly considered committing another attack there. The suspect was also known to law enforcement. In 2019, police responded after someone reported that he had tried to kill himself. And just months later, officers came to his home and took away a sword, a dagger, and more than a dozen other knives after a family member reported that he had vowed to, quote, kill everyone. Yet just months later, in January 2020, Illinois granted the suspect a gun permit, which he used to buy multiple firearms. To be clear, they took away his knives, but let him buy guns. Illinois State Police now say that the suspected shooter's application for a permit was sponsored by his father. So much about this tragedy is shocking, but how shocked were you when you learned that the suspect was a man, not a woman, and a white man too, and that he was just 21 years old? Probably not that shocked. It fits a recent pattern, one seen in Buffalo and El Paso and Pittsburgh. But it's not the whole story, according to two researchers. Dr. Gillian Peterson and Dr. James Densley have spent the past half decade building the Violence Project, a database on every mass shooter who has killed more than three people in a public place since 1966. Some of their findings are unsurprising. Of the 172 mass shooters they study, nearly all, all but four of them, were men. And a smaller majority, but a majority nevertheless, were white. They also found, though, that while racial and religious hatred are present in many of these attacks, they are less a cause than a symptom. Interviews with dozens of shooters and the people who knew them led Peterson and Densley to conclude, quote, shooters often have the same motivation to cause as much death and destruction as possible so that a world that had otherwise ignored them would be forced to notice them and feel their anguish. Mass shooters, they say, walk a common route to violence through childhood traumas, disappointments and existential doubts. They're often openly self-destructive and suicidal. And like the Highland Park shooting suspect, the vast majority of mass shooters communicate their plans before acting on them. Peterson and Densley published those findings last year in a book, The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. Their hope is to get politicians to recognize that we can identify and treat likely mass shooters before they do irreversible and catastrophic damage. Quote, it begins with a shift in mindset. Mass shooters are not them, they are us. Boys and men we know, our children, our students, our colleagues, our community. This fact may make mass shooters seem harder to stop. The reality is quite the opposite. But in a gun-crazed America, an America where it's all too easy to dismiss the death and destruction as evil done by monsters, an America where, let's face it, we all are experiencing trauma, anxiety, isolation, is such a care-based approach to mass shootings realistic? Will it be successful? Can it be done? Let's ask one of the researchers behind the idea, criminology professor Gillian Peterson of Hamline University, joins me now. Thank you so much for joining me. You are the co-founder of The Violence Project, the co-author of the book that I just mentioned of the same name. So let me just ask the most basic of questions to begin with. Why men? Why is the American mass shooter almost invariably male and the majority of them white too? It's actually kind of a complicated question that there's a lot of different answers to, kind of depending on who you ask. But we do know that the majority of perpetrators of all forms of homicide, over 90% of them are men. And so this follows that trend. We know that mass shooters tend to see themselves in previous shooters. They tend to kind of identify with the ones that came before them, which is why you see the same profile merge again and again, because perpetrators see themselves and want to emulate. And so there's also this kind of idea of, um, men perhaps feeling like they are owed more in society. And so then being more upset and more angry when they don't get it and lashing out. So my, on that note, my colleague Ben Collins has been pouring through the Highland Shooters online postings, including a sort of manifesto. Here's what he told viewers on MSNBC about it last night. This guy had been planning this for this long. He had posted that as an Amazon ebook in February. This guy really wanted to be known as a mass shooter in the burgeoning mass shooter culture that exists on the Internet, where he thought he had a community, basically. The burgeoning mass shooter culture that exists on the Internet. That is a chilling statement, is it not? These people are finding a community of support for their worst impulses online. How is an intervention by 
family or friend supposed to stop that, especially when they may not grasp just how radicalized, extreme their loved ones are getting on the internet? Yeah, this is a pattern we see again and again where perpetrators are spending a lot of time online, they're going down rabbit holes, they're finding communities that celebrate mass shootings and this form of violence. In that way, social media has kind of been an accelerant to this problem. It used to be that you might have to go out and find people who think like you, and now there's yes. just these higher cultures of them. I think... It, we support this idea of holistic violence prevention. So there's a lot of different strategies. One strategy is what is the role of social media companies in being held responsible for this kind of rhetoric that's happening on their platforms? How do we identify when the rhetoric is getting particularly dangerous? And then how do we train families and people who care about these people to know what they're doing online, to reach out and to be concerned when they're seeing this type of thing? So yesterday, uh, GOP Senate leader Mitch McConnell told a crowd in Kentucky that he wants to, quote, do a better job of identifying people who have these mental problems before they carry out those awful atrocities. Of course, for many Republicans, focusing on a shooter's background helps them evade a difficult debate about guns in America. I know that. On the other hand, a lot of people are talking about, you know, how do we prevent this from happening? I wonder, is there a danger of going too far in that direction of intervening with someone on the basis of, quote, unquote, mental problems further stigmatizing them, pushing them into worse behaviors? I mean, does it get close to going after pre-crimes? There is a danger there. I think we have to be really careful with how we do this. And it's not about going after people with mental problems. We did take a very deep dive into mental illness and the role it plays in these crimes. And it's really one piece of a really complicated pathway to violence. We don't look at profiles. We look at pathways, right? So how does a person go along this pathway and get to the point of doing this? If you're intervening saying, I'm worried that you're going to be a school shooter, so I'm going to be criminally charging you or I'm going to expel you or I'm going to fire you from work, that's the wrong approach. But if we can say, yes. hey, you're showing some of these warning signs, I'm worried about you. It seems like you're in crisis. How do we get you connected with the resources that you need? Maybe you're preventing a mass shooting. Maybe you're preventing self-harm or depression or whatever it is. There's kind of this diffusion of benefits of this approach if it's done right. So I got to ask a question uh, about something the right wing is obsessed with, and that is drug use. There's an increasing tendency to blame mass shootings on drug use over on Fox. They've been fixated on marijuana. Last night, Laura Ingram uh, cited reports that the Highland Park shooter was a pot smoker and then said this. Have a listen. Now, one look at him and to the untrained eye, he looks like a complete psychotic. Have you ever seen anyone looking like him? And what can regular pot use trigger in young men in particular? Psychosis and other violent personality changes. You have studied these men. Is pot turning them into psycho killers? It is not. So we coded each of these perpetrators on over 200 different pieces of life history information. It is all publicly available, the database that people can download and play with it and look for patterns. One thing we coded everybody on is drug use, alcohol use, even sort of prescription medications, everything. And you do not see patterns there with pot use. Thank you for that fact check. I felt like we didn't need it, but I wanted to hear it from you anyways. Gillian Peterson, appreciate your research. Thank you for your time today.